I have to say that, that um, um, I'm so um, touched, uh, first of all, that uh, the exhibition is here. And as uh, Michael Glickman has said, I think it's the right place to, uh, uh, to show this. Uh, it has been in two art museums, uh, obviously, uh, the Art Gallery of Ontario, which owns the collection. And then it was at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and, um, uh, you know, they, they had audiences that are, are quite um, different. That's not to say that we did not have audiences to which this exhibition touched, but I think that uh, here it will have a very special place at this uh, memorial and museum. And uh, I think that uh, I hope you will um, uh, look into the, the exhibition. The pictures are very small. Uh, there are some big ones too, but for the most part they're very small. Uh, so it takes time, you know, you have to kind of uh, uh, become acquainted with them. Um, what I like to do is, um, I like to read something that my good friend uh, Bernice Eisenstein wrote in the exhibition catalog, and it's not long, it's just a few words, but it, it's relevant. It says, for every occasion on which the memory of the Holocaust is unearthed, time finds us newly located. We have moved along its linear path through the measured passage of days and with the accumulation of years, repeatedly to discover that the protective boundaries of ourselves have been altered by the ghostly refrain. And it is on one of the addresses, addresses us with a request accompanied by the awareness of a debt to be paid, remember us. And I think those words are very poignant because uh, the uh, Ross's idea, Ross's inspiration uh, in the ghetto was to preserve this body of work and um, uh, it was to remember the, um, what he called the martyrdom of the Jews of Poles, uh, the disappearing um, Jews that were from day to day disappearing uh, in the Lodz ghetto. And, um, so one of his uh, tactics to save this about 6,000 negatives that he had uh, photographed, most of them uh, um, done on, in the clandestine way because uh, there was restrictions on what he could photograph after 1941, December. Um, but uh, so he buried them. So uh, in the ground in the fall of uh, 1944, when the Lodz ghetto was being liquidated, uh, with most of the inhabitants being sent off to Auschwitz. Um, he was very fortunate uh, that uh, he was uh, kept behind uh, one of the crews, which were the cleanup crew. And um, the cleanup crew, uh, actually, in my research, turns out that uh, um, was really uh, saved uh, about 800 plus people, 803. There was actually a few more, but they were in hiding, wisely. <laughs> um, but um, uh, it was the greed of Bierbau, because he was convinced that the Jews were still hiding uh, valuables in table legs and in the walls and so forth. So he, he um, decided that this was to, uh, worth his while. And in the meanwhile, of course, the, um, they were digging a, 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 a sort of a huge grave to which he anticipated that the Gestapo would kill off the remaining. However, the Red Army uh, was coming too close and he went into hiding and subsequently uh, was uh, found and uh, taken to Lodz Ghetto and still trial and was executed. Um, but my point here is that it's the importance of the photographs. Uh, they work pretty much as sort of a surrogates for the memories that we have and they do keep uh, they keep the, uh, not only the Lodz ghetto alive, but I think the larger tragedy that, uh, you know, that people suffered throughout. Um, I think that um, Ross's, uh, is, is Ross's collection is, to my knowledge, probably the largest collection, 300 of these uh, negatives survived, that are actually taken by a Jewish photographer. Uh, there were Mandel Grossman's photographs too, but a lot of them perished uh, during the uh, war in Israel. And um, uh, there are a few scant records uh, available that were sent uh, to the Chronicle and Lodz, and some are there. But for the most part, uh, most of the pictures that you see uh, of the Holocaust were taken by the perpetrators. And there's a whole different, uh, when you look at them, there's a whole different um, 
uh, uh, sort of a character to them. They are mostly undignified. Uh, they try to uh, point out to the, uh, the oddities uh, to humiliate. Uh, and I find that when you look at Ross's pictures, I think that there is a recognition uh, of the life and the trials and the peril that people lived through, but it is done, it's certainly through his camera when he looks at it, that um, there is always the bearing that these people are very important and that there is a story to tell. And the story that he wanted to tell was about the Jews in Lod's ghetto. So in 1940, uh, uh, he was um, rounded up amongst other Jews. Uh, into, he lived in Lodz, but was taken into the perimeter uh, of Baluchi, which was the uh, area which was uh, made into the ghetto, which was then um, uh, sort of rounded up by barbed wire, uh, hermetically pretty much sealed from the rest of the world. And uh, he was uh, accosted first by the uh, German Gestapo because he had a camera. On the other hand, the camera also saved him because uh, it was then determined that they needed identity pictures for everybody that was in the ghetto. And so he was then hired um, uh, by the statistics department, which was uh, administered um, uh, by um, Chaim Romkowski uh, for, the, for part of the Jewish administration. But for the most part, the the tasks that he had to do was the uh, ID pictures, which I think there's a, an enlargement in the show and a very tiny one that will show you on how he kind of decided that this is the one way I can begin to save film. So on the one film, he took a number of pictures at the same time. He put little boards in between each individual and then cut out the individual frames for the ID pictures. So already in 1940, he had this idea because he was a photojournalist and photojournalists by instinct and by need and by desire want to tell a story. They want to tell you what's going on in the world. I don't think he anticipated and, and uh, that at that time what the outcome would be four years later. Um, but at the time he then started to photograph um, the people when they came into the ghetto. Lodz itself had been an um, industrial city in the, uh, of some considerable uh, uh, wealth and stature up until World War I at which time it fell into, into uh, uh, to certain demise and the industries that had um, been, you know, had prospered people. Uh, so the whole area was, you know, considered one of the poorest and that's where the Jews were being, uh, you know, sort of hoarded in. Uh, it had problems with um, water, it had problems with sewage, it had problems with all kinds of what we consider, you know, <laughs> essential livelihoods. Um, but the, um, uh, the, uh, the administration, at least the Jewish administration under, under Ronkowski, um, was you know, requested to create an orderly city and they did set up orphanages for the children. There were schools, um, there was some theater, uh, certainly some education, hospitals and doctors and even a post office. And of course then they changed the name of the city from Lodz to Lynchmannstadt. What happened, of course, is that all of these things that were supposed to uh, <clears throat> give you dignity to your daily life was all taken away, certainly by 1941, uh, December, uh, when the decree came also that he wasn't allowed to photograph, along with other, with Mandel Grossman and others, that they could only do official photography. So aside from doing the, um, uh, the pictures uh, of, um, for the ID cards, his task was to do propaganda photographs and to show, of course, that how well uh, the Jews were being treated uh, by the Germans, how industrious they were, and you will see there's a section on the mattress factory and the letters factory, which are highly mediated photographs, uh, highly posed, everybody looks beautifully dressed, when <laughs> clearly at the same time, it's evident that life was in great despair and also in peril from day to day. Um, he also had to photograph the, um, the individuals that were found on the street who had died from starvation, 
There was no food. I mean, the rations were already set in. Um, if, you didn't, if you didn't get any work, and that wasn't always easy to come by. I mean, there was a system by which we could, you were hired. Um, in, the, in the factories, there were metal factories. There was the leather factories, the mattress ones. There was the textile industries. But they were all, it was pretty much all slave labor. And uh, uh, you got nothing. You got, you know, some you know, rotten potatoes once in a while, and Ross photographs, all of those kind of uh, images on your, you know, your, your whole sort of a daily activity is pretty much comes clear through his pictures. And he photographed the whole arc, and one of the issues, of course, that often has come up and, and is that there are so many people also in his photographs that, uh, you know, are happy seem to be having parties, uh, seem to be having celebrations. And those, that was actually very important. You know, people had hope. They wanted to celebrate someone's birthday. They wanted to have a good time. They, they definitely needed those. And they became a form of a resistance. I mean, if you didn't have that, you know, and if you were only having to um, be treated in, in a subhuman way, you needed those moments. And those were these difficult pictures because I think those are the ones that people say, well, you know, there was a hierarchy. There are hierarchies probably everywhere, it's here in this very town where I come from. Uh, but I think that the, the issue with Ross was that he wanted to have um, portraits of these individuals shown in a dignified way. And I think there is a, at the very end of the exhibition, you will see a large display of families having um, time together, gathering around the table. Uh, there are the uh, individual portraits. And also it shows these pictures, the skill that Ross himself um, put into it. There are pictures where he uses people with mirrors in it so that you get your double portrait, you get your front and your back. Uh, he does little, little you know, sort of symbolic little things. He has people climbing up into trees. You know, he tries to humanize these pictures as a photographer. And I think those is probably one of the most beautiful, poignant kind of med wall of meditation, I call it, where you can look at these people in an extremely dignified uh, way. But to go on uh, with this material is that um, um, Ross, for some period of time, struggled with it. There is absolutely he struggled with it. And so the question is always come, you know, how come we didn't have this material sooner? Why wasn't it out there? And I think that most of you know that the, the material that was uh, preferred by the journalists, by the magazines, and so forth, of course, was the rescue of the camps. Those became the iconic images. They were very direct. The horror was right there. You piles of bodies, you know, people having starving, uh, you know, in, in behind barbed wires, you know. And so those are the pictures that sort of sent the message immediately. The thought that, uh, people suffered over a long period of time and being slowly being starved to death and being worked to death, uh, somehow did not have the journalistic appeal and it took a long, long time. And I think it's only in the last sort of a seven or eight years that we're beginning to get uh, an, a kind of a focus on that, those kind of narratives. And a lot has come out of testimonials people who talk about what it was like, what it was like to be a survivor. You know, it wasn't just, you know, people say, well, you're lucky that you're a survivor. Well, you might be lucky, but, you know, there is a story, and in most cases, the stories were not pretty. Those were hardship. They were, they were, they were very difficult. And I think it's through these stories and through the testimonials that Ross's pictures have taken on a new meaning. So, when I came across this material, that would have been in 2003 in London, uh, at the place called the Archive of Modern Conflict, I've been working with archive, which have to do exactly what it says. So I've been working with conflict. What, is, what do photographs of conflict look like? I was, I was very interested in you know, how do you tell uh, somebody that what's conflicted about it? What does it tell about life? What does it tell about the politics at the time? What's the ideology behind it, you know? And what is the photographic documentary aspect that's going to reveal something to us? 
And um, when I was working at that archive, uh, I was going through a binder, and I was looking at these prints, and these were not the small original prints, these were smaller copy prints, and I'll talk about something about that a little bit later. And uh, I looked at this material, and um, I said, this is, this is quite amazing. We had collections of uh, material from the 1920s, 1930s, press photography, particularly from the illustrated magazines from Germany, and we had pictures of uh, the uh, illustrated uh, magazines from Britain, but we had nothing, nothing like this. You know, uh, most of them showed you know people in good sports and 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 people doing all kinds of activities, uh, people playing around with cameras and and. Uh, and they were kind of a narrative pictures, but looking at these, and then when I came back to my gallery, I went to our director, Matthew Teilbaum, and I said, you know, Matthew, we have, I've just seen this material, and, and we need this material at the ATO. So, um, and I said, you know, we got to get it. And the usual thing is, you know, why do you need it? And I said, well, it's because it's, not, it's powerful. It tells one of the more powerful stories, and we've missed out on it with all of the stuff that we already have in the collection. We need this material. This, this tells, uh, it's, this is really touches humanity. And, and so I got in we got in touch with the Archive of Modern Conflict, and they said, well, we're actually working on a book. And so we can't give you this material. And we're doing a book, and uh, um, this book was published called The Lodz Ghetto Album. Um, and um, it was a, it's a wonderful book. Um, it's, it touches, uh, Thomas Weber is a, is a good scholar, but, uh, and he tells the story in, in a very clear, uh, factual uh, way. What the book, though, doesn't, didn't understand in my way, and, and that's not a criticism of it, it's it didn't deal with the photographs themselves. Uh, they kind of divided these are private and these were personal because they had never looked and studied actually the negatives. And what I was able to, when we got the collection and we persuaded the owner of the Archive of Modern Conflict, um, they said, okay, you can have them. Actually, we're gonna gift it to you. We're gonna donate them to you. So, you know, that was a wonderful, great news. But then started the actual study on what do these photographs actually mean? How were they made? And we're talking about negatives. And we're an image-based uh, institution. We collect painting, sculpture, printmaking, photographs, the real objects. Negatives you can't display. They are there, but they tell you the story. So to me, it was very important to start analyzing them. And what I was able to find was the, actually the timeline when some of these pictures were taken. And so the sort of the criticism that came out about all the pictures that show these, the people living a sort of an elitist life were all taken before 1941, December. This is when people were coming into the ghetto you still had your clothing, you still had your dignity, you still actually had your feather pillows. Later on, I find out that feather pillows were taken away, uh, they from the people, and because they wanted them for the German soldiers. So you had to collect up all the pillows in the, by the Catholic Church Square, they were emptied out and you know, de-loused and defected, as they, as they said, you know, and then given to someone else. This is also when people still had a warm coat to wear, had shoes on their feet. So these were pictures when people had entered into the, into the ghetto, very dignified, um, you know, with full of hope, war's gonna be over, this is all very temporary. Nobody, of course, anticipating that this was gonna go on for another, you know, uh, you know up to 1944, uh, for the most tragic uh, time. So the grim reality that after 19, uh, 41, of course, the, the, probably the worst one uh, in September of 1942, uh, when the, the empty, the children and children under 10, and the sick and the elderly in huge amounts were sent off, up to something like 20,000 were sent off to Chalmo to be gassed. Uh, so you can see, and this was. This is when the hospitals collapsed, the orphanages collapsed, all of them, because new groups were coming in from Luxembourg, from Germany, creating a lot of chaos, actually, in it, because there was, of course, the difficulty of language, you know, unless you spoke Yiddish, but 
you know, most German uh, Jews didn't. So there was all these conflicts going on, and this is where some of that turmoil uh, started, um, uh, you know, black marketeering and so forth. And, um, you know, Romkowski, although he's been demonized a lot, uh, took this idea that if I keep the labor component going, like our way is work, you know, um, Unserweigen ist Arbeiten, you know, uh, that somehow uh, we will show to the Germans uh, that, um, that the Jewish labor is worthwhile. Um, of course, what it was doing was, of course, helping the war effort in some ways, you know, all those leathers, that boots that were being made went for the soldiers. Uh, the mattresses went elsewhere. I mean, nobody benefited in the, in the ghetto from it. Uh, but he felt that if this was a, um, a place where um, Germans would appreciate uh, the Jewish, I mean, it was miscalculated and misguided. Uh, but it's also on those basis that I think that we still have um, the people that survived. And we also have this amazing record that um, uh, Ross was able to, to uh, photograph and, uh, and doing a lot of it surreptitiously and doing on the street. He was helped a lot by his wife, Stefania, who was actually working in the kitchen. And she admits to it, she pilfered food sometimes so that he would have more access to film because although he had access to the film and to the dark room, there was the problem, of course, that, that you would uh, uh, get caught. And in the exhibition is um, uh, a photograph that I think is really quite amazing. It's and the man carrying the Torah photographed from the back. And then the other one is where he's standing up on, on the rubble holding it. And in uh, reading in Ross's own sort of a reference to that picture, he said that he saw that this uh, Torah had been saved. I mean, this is a moment that he had to have a picture of. And he clicks it and takes it, you know, from the back. The man turns around and is petrified, you know, that are you, you know, from the Gestapo or are you the police is going to, um, you know, take me and then I'm going to be executed. Ross says, no, 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 I'm here to take a picture of the Torah that's been saved. And so the man says, you know, to him, okay, well, that's good then. And I'm going to pose and stand for it. And he stands up on the rubbles of the synagogue and holds the Torah in his hands, you know. So when you find out that there are these wonderful stories within the pictures, you recognize, you know, how important it is that these pictures uh, were saved and, and preserved. The difficulty we ran into, of course, with it is that when he buried them into the ground, um, there were seepages into the jars, and the negatives have all of these unbelievable kind of permutations around it. The, the nitrate um, gelatin on which was on the film is peeling away. But I find something very fascinating about it because, of course, it gives a sense of history to the pictures. But I find the most amazing things that so many faces were actually saved. Even though they're deteriorating all around, the faces are still coming through. And that is so poignant and, and so important and so touching to see that, particularly some of the children's faces that are, they seem to, you know, the photographs have somehow captured and they are surviving and, and, and existing through this kind of imagery. So, you know, Ross's um, effort, I think, to save this material, I think, is, was quite phenomenal. And as I said, we're extremely lucky because it's only because of this material that um, uh, we are able to do this show. The show has some 200 and some images. I'm dealing with a collection that has close to 3,000. So just to tell you this distinction, so when you are in the exhibition and you see the pictures that are framed in frames, those are the original pictures taken by Ross, which he was able to save. Um, the pictures that you see that are pinned on the wall and have all the sprockets from the film around it and have all kinds of numbers on it uh, are actually modern prints that we have taken from the existing negatives because there are no corresponding vintage prints on it. And the majority of the collection is of these negatives. So 
In the exhibition is also something called the folio, and it has these very small 35 millimeter um, pictures that were organized um, by Ross himself when he was in Israel. And um, I was so thrilled when I came across that because I thought, oh, here he is telling me the whole story. So here is Ross's view of the story. And of course, this was, he worked on it from about 1970 up until 1980, doing what he called a catalog. And so he has all these numbers. These numbers make absolutely no sense in terms of the chronological order. And this is when I say that we were able to analyze these negatives in a kind of a forensic way because when you process negatives, there's all kinds of telltale marks. First of all, there are the different emulsion bases. We discovered there are 11 different emulsion bases. Also, when you dry these negative strips, you know, you have this sort of a squeegee that leaves markings. And we were able to bring together the, the collections of negatives that he had been cutting up into smaller pieces to create the narratives for it. So this is why we have the narrative, for instance, of the mattress factory, because we can bring them all together. And we know that this is one story, and so we can separate out individual stories from it. There are a lot more pictures to them, you know, but you know, we only have a selection over here. So having this very, very uh, fragile material, um, we only had, we had to digitize it. And what have we done? Because nitrous negatives are against the law, they're illegal, they're flammable. We buried them into ice. They are in an ice box, you know. So it's interesting. He buried them into the ground, they surface, and we buried them back into the ice to preserve them, you know. So this is sort of a long story. But going back to the little 35 millimeter negatives, which you can actually see on a screen that moves very, very slowly where they are, and that um, is, I was hoping that I would see his story, and it would seem that. By this time, uh, Ross was, could not construct the story because after about five or six strips, he has in there the, um, uh, the, 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 the Red Army soldiers coming in and they're having a little bit of a festivity on it. So there's no way that he kept the narrative because this didn't happen until 45. And the first few pictures that he shows are from about 1941, 42. So the story that I was looking at it was almost, you know, uh, so difficult to reconstruct. So he was, and I thought, well, maybe he's trying to tell me that every day was the same. I wake up, you know, I'm cold, I'm hungry, I got some work to do. Uh, people are dying on the street. People are, are, are miserable, life in peril every day. People are being deported every day. So I thought, well, maybe he was just trying to jumble up that every day was the same. But it doesn't quite work out to that. And um, I had a very good friend who's written in the, in this, uh, in the book um, who had been a, a photographer who had worked under war and in conflict and, and been in Nicaragua and worked under stressful situations. And he says that it's a trauma, that it's actually very traumatic to go back and trying to reconstruct sometimes visually. You can maybe do it more emotionally because you know what your feelings are, but to put pictures into order and so I think the folio is an incredible piece of art, I would say. It's a collage. Um, but it didn't reveal to me what we had to do, which was to do the forensic study later on of all the negative strips, you know. So um, I don't know if um, anybody has any, have you seen the show or if you have any questions? I think I'm using up my time here pretty well. So, um, but I do understand that there are some people that are from, uh, from Lodz, and I would certainly love to talk to anyone who has some memory or something to tell me from, from that. So thank you very much for coming. And, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have. If not, there's the exhibition. <laughs>